On March 30, 1857, federal judge W.W. Drummond, fresh from a stormy year in the Utah Territory, fired off a resignation letter to the White House, making sure copies were distributed to the press. Drummond charged the Mormons with disloyalty and a series of crimes. Among them, the murder of Captain John Gunnison and a survey party, murders that a federal investigation had already attributed to Ute Indians. The only thing he didn't say was whether or not the Mormons were kicking their dogs every morning. The federal officers are daily compelled to hear the form of the American government traduced, the chief executives of the nation slandered and abused from the masses in the most vulgar, loathsome, and wicked men. W.W. W. Drummond, Justice, Utah Territory. Should such a state of things actually exist, as we are led to infer from these reports, the knife must be applied to this pestiferous, disgusting cancer, which is gnawing into the very vitals of the body politic. It must be cut out by the roots and seared over by a red-hot iron of stern, unflinching law. Senator Stephen A. Douglas. In New York and Washington, newspapers were soon demanding action. The Mormons are at the present instant in virtual rebellion against the federal government. It may be requisite to bring fire and sword to bear against them, and the interests of the country, of the human race, and of civilization may require much bloodshed. The New York Times. The controversy fell in the lap of President James Buchanan, already overmatched by an East Coast financial panic and the nation's disintegration over slavery. His advisors, including Secretary of War John Floyd, urged Buchanan to demonstrate leadership. So with all these uh, forces working, Buchanan hits upon this plan with the help of these politicians who say that polygamy is the ideal whipping boy to get people's minds off the slavery question. This is the first rebellion which has existed in our territories and humanity requires that we should put it down in such a manner that it shall be the last. Buchanan stripped Brigham Young of his office, appointed a courtly Georgian by the name of Alfred Cumming as governor, and ordered 2,500 troops under General William Harney to install Cumming and crush the rebellion. Buchanan did not bother to inform the Utah Territory of his actions. The people would find out in a dramatic fashion. On July 24th, 1,000 Mormons were gathered in Big Cottonwood Canyon, celebrating the 10th anniversary of their settlement. From the east, Porter Rockwell rode in with word of the Army's march. Citing the sufferings of the Mormon people before their move to Utah, Brigham Young ordered that, this time, his people would not bend. In beginning in August, he literally spends all of his days at, at his office, surrounded by secretaries, and he begins giving marching orders. He writes a blizzard of letters to every corner of the world, to every Mormon, and his instructions are explicit. President Young, in his sermon, declared that the thread was cut between us and the United States, and that the Almighty recognized us as a free and independent people and that no officer appointed by government should come and rule over us from this time forth. Hosea Stout. The army got a late start from Fort Leavenworth. That did little to discourage General Harney, who had developed a hard-charging and ruthless reputation in fighting Indians. He was telling his colleagues in private, the only way to handle the Mormons is to hang them. And when I get into Salt Lake, they'll all be strung up on Temple Square, and that will be that. The 2,500 troops represented more than 20% of the entire United States Army, the largest single force in the nation's history. This was a full-fledged army. When they, when they mounted up each morning and, and uh, put on, pulled on their boots, it was a, a seven-mile caravan. The spirit was ripe for a fight. In the 10th Infantry was Captain Jesse Gove of Massachusetts. We have made 19 miles today. Everybody in fine health. The sun is out and quite warm. If the Mormons will only fight, the days are numbered. We shall sweep them from the face of the earth, and Mormonism in Utah will cease. Our campaign will then be at an end. Captain Jesse A. Gove.
the collision course of war was set. In Utah, the militia prepared itself to stand ground and defend the faith. Send 2,500 troops here to make a desolation of this people. God Almighty helping me. I will fight until there is not a drop of blood left in my veins. Good God, I have enough wives to whip the United States, for they will whip themselves. Heber C. Kimball. This people are free. They are not in bondage to any government on God's footstool. We have transgressed no law, neither do we intend so to do. But as for any nation coming to destroy this people, God Almighty being my helper, it shall not be. And you add that war hysteria on top of a year of, of basically unending religious reformation and a kind of frenzy that's going on, and you have an explosive situation. In late summer, martial law was declared in the Utah Territory. Citizens of Utah, we are invaded by a hostile force who are evidently assailing us to accomplish our overthrow and destruction. Our duty to our country, our holy religion, our God to freedom and liberty requires that we should not quietly stand still. Brigham Young, Governor. The word went out. Repel invaders. Let no one enter. <laughs> 